about the nature deficit disorder. This is a term that you have coined. What yeah. does it mean? Yeah. Well, first, it's not a, a known medical diagnosis, and I make that clear in both books. Uh, maybe it should be, but it's not. What it is is a handy way to describe what a lot of us have felt was going on for a long time, which is first the disconnection between children and nature, which is, which is huge. I mean, it's, this is a, a, what Bill McKibben calls one of the biz, biz, biggest, largest experiments in human history that we're doing with our kids now by basically pulling them out of nature for the most part. Um, and there are implications for that. Uh, this is also true for adults, increasingly. Some of the kids that I interviewed for La uh, Last Child in the Woods now are adults. They're parent young parents themselves. Uh, so this, this is going to have a profound impact on the human experience of just being alive. And we need to really think seriously about what kind of world we're going to get if that continues. Uh, well, I think that nature deficit disorder and, and climate change are bookends, in a sense, of, of the same issue. Um, they often also have approximately the same window of opportunity for us to do something about them. Uh, how many decades will go by where this disconnection between children and nature and now adults from nature continues before it's too late, before the culture loses its memory? of a time when it was normal, considered normal for kids to go outside and just play in the woods and dig a hole, and build a fort. We don't have a lot of time to fix that. Now, a lot of good things are happening, but at the same time, we have climate change. Um, I, I'm, I'm ambivalent about how we think about climate change. On the one hand, it's a, it's a terrible thing that, we, that our pollution is speeding up that process. And we have to do whatever we can to slow that down, at least. That's true. But if we fill our kids and ourselves with fear, with that post-apocalyptic vision, we're not going to make much progress. Um, yes, the waters will rise, but we still have to live. So how can we live well? And I think that, uh, you know, associated with some of the uh, ways of slowing down climate change uh, are ways that we can live in a way that we are better than we are now. If we truly greened our cities, and I'm not just talking about solar panels, I'm talking about parks and, you know, um, uh, green workplaces. And I don't, again, I don't mean saving energy, just that. I mean producing human energy by you know, having more nature around us, which makes us happier and smarter and, and, uh, and healthier. What if we did that? Uh, we have to stop talking as if the end of the world is near. We have to be careful how we talk to our kids about the future. When we start talking to them way too early, when they're very small, about climate change and all these terrible things that we do face, and we're talking to those kids about that, and they get that message from television, et cetera. At the exact, in the exact same years in which they're not being allowed to go out and just play in nature just for the joy of it, then that sets them up to think of nature associated for the rest of their lives with fear and destruction. That's not doing them or the environment any favors. Uh, so we have to be careful about being overwhelmed by the negative environmental issues we do face. Another way to look at it is that because of climate change and pollution and these huge problems we face environmentally, everything in the next 40 years must change. We'll need new kinds of agriculture already beginning. We'll need new kinds of uh, architecture and urban design already beginning. We'll need new kinds of uh, energy, of course, already beginning. We'll need a new kind of civilization. Now, to any self-respecting, creative 16-year-old, that's good news if you, if you frame it that way. Uh, and we need to begin to think about it in that way. Otherwise, we're just going to settle unconsciously for this post-apocalyptic vision. And is that what we're going to hand over to our kids and grandkids? That vision or a, bit, or a different one?
there's a great book people ought to read, which is uh, Bringing Nature Home. And I quote the man who wrote it, Doug Ptolemy, quite a bit in that chapter. Uh, and he says that gardeners have enormous power right now that they don't recognize. That if we conserved every square inch of wilderness we've got today, and I hope we do, it won't be enough to provide the biodiversity or bring back the biodiversity that we need. Uh, if, however, we did that plus, we changed most of the yards in suburbia uh, into native plants and to a different kind of, of uh, botany, uh, uh, we could bring back butterfly migration routes by planting the right plants. We could bring back birds that have long since left our cities uh, certain species. Think how powerful families would feel, how, how powerful kids could feel if they thought that this plant that they're planting in their backyard, it's not just pretty, it's actually healing uh, something huge, uh, a butterfly migration route. Um, I think that a, a good future is going to belong to the nature smart, people who really understand the transformative power of nature uh, in our lives. Uh, businesses that are truly na nature smart will be more quote unquote sustainable. Uh, uh, you know, teachers who understand the transformative power of nature, their students will do better. Schools that understand that, test scores will go up if they get those kids into nature more. That's what the studies are showing. Um, policymakers who understand that will be energized. They won't be saying the same thing over and over ad nauseum. They'll actually be talking about a different world that we could move to. This one. But it would look very different. Uh, uh, parents who understand the transformative power of nature, the restorative power of nature on their own children and themselves, those families will be happier and healthier. They'll bond more. I mean, that's one of the chapters in the Nature Principle is about family bonding and the, the impact of getting out into nature on literally the ability to, of a family to bond. Uh, there are a thousand ways that we can become more nature smart and we will have better lives and we'll build a better, better uh, civilization if we, if we do that. And I have great hopes that uh, younger people in particular uh, are going to understand this. Uh, I'm always struck by the young people who come up to me after speeches or raise their hand and say, I want to change my career. I want a career connecting people to nature. Mm -hmm. Where do I go to school? What careers can I have? I don't have great answers for them right now, but I deal with it to a degree in the book. And the look in their eyes and the look in people who are already doing this kind of work in their eyes is impressive. This is a, a look of joy in their eyes. This is happy work. Imagine that. Be doing happy work that's associated with the future of the environment, the future of the human race. What is your advice, last word you would like to audience to hear you? I think that we need a new nature movement. I think uh, environmentalism is in trouble in many ways. It's, it's not convincing people anymore. Uh, and the people who le lead the big environmental organizations know this. Uh, there are aging populations in the environmental uh, groups. Uh, they're not getting the diversity that they're going to have to have in order to reflect America. But more important, they're not presenting a, a, a wonderful picture of the future that people will want to go to. And they understand this. C sustainability alone is not sustainable. Uh, uh, simply talking about energy efficiency does not touch the heart in most people, some people it does. But the idea of producing human energy through new kinds of uh, cities, new kinds of schools, new kinds of workplaces, new kinds of homes, what we can do today in our home, that touches people. They, they want that. They're hungry for that. Uh, there are a no number of other reasons uh, that I think that we need a, what I call a new nature movement. Uh, but one of the most important reasons is that unless we do this, then the people who care about nature will lose ever more power, even more power than they're losing now. But 
there are these small movements out there, the food movement, the slow food movement, um, the, um, uh, the biophilic design movement, uh, the simplicity movement, the uh, uh, people who are the pediatricians who are now beginning to prescribe nature to kids and families, and this is happening. Uh, uh, there are uh, the environmental movement that still exists, which we have to, uh, of course, respect and build as well. The sustainability movement through design and all that. The uh, children in nature movement, which has brought all kinds of people together into the same uh, room that don't want to be there in the same room usually, but they'll come together on that one. Uh, I think that we now, that environmentalism now is a pup tent and we need a big tent. And this big tent would have all of those movements and more underneath the roof of that tent. Uh, and that when we see all of that as one movement, uh, then there will be enough power to uh, create this uh, civilization that I'm describing. One that our, our lives are as immersed in nature as they are in technology every day. Thank you very much for your generosity Good. and your time Good. in writing a great book. Oh, thanks.